Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's good to, to be here for Mike's birthday. So if you look at the, the, the poster for the conference, uh, this is a picture of Mike wearing a, a formal suit and a, and a tie. And for many years, this was the only thing I knew about him. Uh, and because each time you go to a IHES website or you get the newsletter, uh, you learn that he has been helping fundraising stuff or, or organizing things for people who care about IHES. And for a long time, it was the only thing I knew about him. And then about three years ago, he, he got interested in, uh, in what we were doing in formalized mathematics around Lean. And, uh, and he came very quietly um, and asking questions about uh, what we are doing and getting enthusiastic about it. And, uh, and also, also maybe doing the same thing he's doing here, just to trying to help and uh, using people he knows and, uh, and maybe trying to find ways to put people in connections, uh, especially people who have money they could spend, uh, but in a, in a very quiet way. No, not, not all about fancy dinners and, uh, and ties. And so it's also very much appreciated when he does this uh, in, in a more quiet way. So thanks for, for all this. And uh, indeed, uh, I'll be uh, discussing this question, why explain mathematics to a computer? So we've been uh, listening to artificial intelligence and uh, theorem proving talks uh, since this morning. But the reason why we won't want to do that was maybe not the main focus of, of those talks. And also I want to show uh, what it looks like when you don't have artificial intelligence but still try to explain mathematics to a computer. So the first very important point to understand is that the goal of all those people uh, who are formalizing mathematics recently, and mathematicians that have been formalizing uh, mathematics recently, uh, is not to uh, put mathematicians out of a job and uh, by replacing uh, mathematics by something completely different. We want to extend the mathematical toolbox, but keeping everything we like already. We want to have more. Uh, even if you look at such a great place as uh, IHES, there are very different styles of doing mathematics. And uh, it's pretty clear that if you talk about mathematics with uh, Ofer Gaber, or if you talk about mathematics with uh, Misha Gromov, uh, they have different ways of, uh, of thinking about mathematics and, uh, and different uh, level of attention to details. I mean, probably, I mean, Gaber thinks details are more important than, uh, than Gromov. And I'm not here to say that Gaber is right and we should do uh, super detailed mathematics all the time and, and just uh, forget about people who have strong intuition. It was uh, mentioned, the, the battle between Poincaré and, uh, and Hilbert in, uh, in Joseph's talk, and I'm not here to take sides uh, between uh, Poincaré and, and Hilbert. And uh, I, I don't know if those artificial people uh, intelligence will put me out of a job by just replacing mathematicians completely. But I certainly know that uh, if you remove uh, Gromov's contributions to symplectic topology, then I'm definitely out of a job. Uh, so I don't want to do that, right? So you shouldn't uh, get the impression that because I'm explaining mathematics to a computer with superhuman level of details, it means uh, that uh, um, different ways of doing mathematics are not legitimate. And we need everything. I want everything. I mean, I'm greedy, basically. Uh, so today, the, the main goal is to show you what it looks like to explain mathematics to a computer and explain why we want this, why I want this, at least. And I'll try to be careful distinguishing uh, what currently exists and, and what is currently science fiction. And uh, on this, if, if some, at some point, if something is unclear, you shouldn't hesitate to ask me, is this science fiction or is it something that exists today? And uh, the examples that I will uh, show you use Lean, which is a, a rather recent software uh, developed mostly by Leonardo de Moura at Microsoft Research. But there are many other software. This was mentioned already by uh, Joseph, and uh, we showed a bit of, uh, we saw a bit of Maiza and, uh, and Isabel already. And Almost everything I will say in this talk, I mean, I guess everything, except when I actually show uh, the, the system working, applies in a completely, uh, in any modern theorem prover. And uh, so I will mention uh, other proof assistants, so we already mentioned, but in particular Cox, so we have uh, Thierry Cocon in the back row, uh, uh, who is uh, one of the uh, 
uh, creators of, of Coq, and all the works that I will show using Lean, it relies on a uh, on lot of great works by other people, uh, on other proof assistants. And this is not at all uh, a propaganda talk telling you you should use this proof assistant and not this proof assistant or anything like this. So I want first to see what it looks like. So yeah, I want to explain uh, some piece of math to uh, this computer. So I need first to explain uh, uh, the informal version. And so because this is a, a diverse audience, I will take a, a, an elementary uh, statement about uh, metric spaces. Uh, but even if you, if you are not really, uh, if you don't like metric spaces, you can even think those are uh, segments of real numbers. Like x, I say x is a compact metric space, but if you don't like that because you're really doing physics, uh, then you should think x is the interval 0, 1 in, in real number, the compact interval. And uh, I've got a function which is continuous from x to some other metric space y, and the claim is that uh, f is automatically uniformly continuous. And uh, I want the proof to fit on one slide, uh, so I will cheat like we always do. I will use a, a more difficult theorem and prove that one using this uh, more difficult theorem. Uh, so I will reduce this to the extreme value theorem. So uh, recall the goal is this uh, sequence of quantifiers. So for all the positive epsilon, there exists a positive delta, such that for all x and x prime, if the distance between x and x prime is less than delta, then the distance between their images f of x and f of x prime is less than epsilon. So let's fix epsilon, a positive number, and I will uh, consider this set k, which is the set of pair of points in x, so that the distance between their image, the f of p1 and f of p2, is more than epsilon, the epsilon I fixed there. And I say uh, this set is closed because f is assumed to be continuous and the distance function on y is also continuous, on y times y. And because x times x is compact, k is a compact set. And uh, this is where I apply, apply the extreme value theorem to get uh, a point p in k, so a pair of points in x whose distance, uh, which have d images at distance more than epsilon, which uh, realize the minimum of the distance between two points in, uh, between the two components of a point in k. And now the delta I'm looking for, I'm looking for a delta here, is the distance between P1 and P2. And I say that now I need to prove that d for all x, x prime, if the distance is less than delta, then the distance between the image is less than delta. And so this is my, my current goal. And I just contrapose this implication uh, to get the new goal, uh, saying that if uh, x, x prime is in k, uh, then the distance between, uh, because the negation of, of the right hand side is being in k. So if you are in k, then the distance uh, uh, between x and x prime is, is more than uh, p1, p2. And this is exactly the defining uh, property of, uh, of my point p and its two components p1 and p2. So I want to explain this proof to my computer. So I first do the, uh, what uh, Christian says we should be doing. I just copy paste the natural language proof. No, not, not that much. I should have a mouse to do that. So just copy this, and I go to a, a program where I've got the statement of my theorem ready. Uh, so I should do, make that be bigger. So I've got the statement over there. So I've got my metric space x, metric space y. Uh, x is a compact space. f a function from x to y. This is assumption. Uh, of continuity of f, so this assumption is uh, denoted by hf, and the goal is to prove that f is uniformly continuous. And uh, so I, I uh, paste the proof, and, and then uh, things get really bad. I mean, there is red all, all over the place. Uh, things are underlined, uh, there are unknown identifier errors and stuff like that. So currently, uh, this doesn't work to just copy paste from a, a PDF file and have the computer understand. But maybe uh, Christian thinks this is because I'm, I don't know how to use my computer. But uh, as far as I understand, this is still science fiction that we can do that and, and get away with it. <laughs> so uh, let's just comment this out. But keep still, I, I still keep this as an outline of, of the proof. And uh, now you should remark that my screen is split into two parts. So on the left hand side, I'm writing. And on the right hand side, the computer is answering. So the computer uh, answers not much. Uh, up to now, it says uh, 
uh, what are the assumptions. And then there is this funny symbol which looks like a T that is uh, sideways. I, I don't really know what this means. This is a logic stuff. But it says uh, this is the goal. So the goal is to prove uniform continuous F. Hmm? And um, so I first want to uh, say this. Uh, I, I'm rewriting, so this R RW means rewrite. So rewrite using this statement, which is says in a metric uh, space, uniform continuous means this. So uniform continuous if and only if. And uh, indeed, the computer agrees that the, the goal is, is the sequence of uh, quantifiers that I had earlier. And uh, now fix epsilon uh, positive number. This is very easy to explain to the computer. I want to introduce epsilon and give a name to the assumption saying that epsilon is positive. So you see, after this command, epsilon is now a fixed real number. It's above the funny symbol. And I've got an assumption called epsilon post saying that epsilon is positive. And the goal is to prove there exists a positive delta and so on. OK, what was the next step? It was introducing this uh, uh, set k. So I will set this. Is, I'm almost uh, copying uh, what was written. Uh, there are tiny uh, notational differences, but really not much. And this is the definition of k. I mean, the parentheses are slightly weird, but otherwise, uh, I just uh, copy-pasted what was above. And now I want to claim that k is closed, so I need to give a name to this claim. Uh, and I tell the computer uh, k is closed. And now what happens is, uh, instead of having only one goal displayed here, I'm sorry, it's speaking French. Uh, this should be goals instead of but. Uh, <laughs> instead of having one goal, I've got two goals. I need to prove this uh, claim that I just made, that k is closed. And then, when I'll be done with this first goal, uh, I will go back to the, the rest of the proof with an extra assumption, which is this uh, closeness of, uh, of k. Is, is d part of the package which uh, metric space x contains? Yeah, D, I understand. So that's an interesting uh, question. How, what does this D uh, stands for? Uh, for if you click here, uh, you will see that this is something about okay, pseudometric spaces because it's working in uh, some somewhat greater generality. But the important thing is that the computer remembers that this is a distance function on Y. And if you compare to uh, maybe a, a few lines uh, at the end of the proof, or even in uh, yeah, even uh, where are I. Uh, even here, F, yes. uh, even here, I've got two d different d. You see this one, distance between a and b. And the computer tells me this is the distance on capital X, whereas the other one, distance between f of a and f of b, this is a distance function on y. So this is, the, the computer is, is doing a lot of work, actually, to understand what, I, uh, what I'm saying. Uh, it just inferred that from, uh, from the fact that I'm, Talking about distance between uh, a and b, and a and b are in x, the computer says, OK, this should be the distance function on x and not the distance function on y. There's a huge amount of uh, engineering uh, work going into this uh, software. And uh, it's not only about uh, uh, smart foundations and, uh, and dreams. I mean, there is also a, a really, really, these are really impressive achievements of, uh, of humanity to have this kind of software. Yes? <laughs> I mean, you should ask Thierry. Where is Thierry? He left. <laughs> uh, it's, I mean, again, there are a lot of different levels to, to, to of answer. I mean, at, at the very bottom, there is. Let me make it more precise. Uh. So, so for example, when I see Google Translate translate yeah. between two natural languages, yeah. I kind of vaguely understand what's going on, right? You understand something about the statistics of sentences. You do some math. You make some mistakes, etc. Yeah. Here, you can't afford mistakes. And also, it does this thing where it goes backward and adds sentences on the right, further up, right? You know, it can add assumptions yeah. in different places and put things down. So I, I uh, actually have a hard time even conceptualizing how it's doing it. So I mean, I, I could try completely uh, stopping my planned talk and, and try to answer this question, but but really, the the, the question is the answer is complicated, and it's. Uh, I mean, at the very bottom of the story, there is a, a pretty simple program that checks proof in a, in a very low-level language. 
like uh, when you're programming, you know, you, you can program directly the, the CPU using uh, assembly language, or, or you can use a higher level language, maybe C language, where you still have to manage memory and stuff. And then you have languages like Python or, or stuff like that, where the user doesn't care about anything uh, nasty and, uh, and the computer does a lot of work. So you, you have the same kind of, uh, I mean, a kind of analogous uh, layers in, in this business, where at the, at the very bottom there is something uh, that checks proof in a very, very detailed language that, that would be impossible to write directly, and understand directly, and then there are several layers on top of that, uh, helping human beings construct uh, this uh, low-level uh, proof, but without ever displaying those low-level low proofs that are really awful. So let's continue that. So, uh, because we've discussed a bit, uh, we need to go a bit faster. So let's ask the computer for a suggestion about how to prove that K is closed. So just ask for suggestion, and the computer answers with a couple of suggestions. And uh, some of these suggestions, so all those suggestions apply to the current situation, but some of them are quite stupid. I mean, the, the first one is, is not really is, is non-committal. It says, what about showing that the complement is open? Uh, uh, but the, okay, so that's uh, that's not risky. Uh, the second suggestion is, is saying, oh, maybe you should uh, prove that k is finite, and that would imply that k is closed because we are in a metric space. But this is you know, this is not very good. So here we need more work by those artificial intelligence people to sort this list and tell me the good one is is that one. You should use that. Uh, uh, this is a set of points where one continuous function is less than another one. So I know I need to prove that the two sides of my inequality are continuous. So first I need to prove that the constant function with value epsilon is continuous. Oh, come on, computer. Uh, this is a boring continuity proof. So I said this is a boring continuity proof. And it actually did both boring continuity proofs that I had. And uh, because the second thing I, I needed to prove was proving that distance between f of p1 and f of p2 is a continuous function. So he did both continuity proofs. And now I'm ready to, to continue. I, I know that k is closed. And now I want to um, prove that um, k is, uh, is compact. And again, I will ask for suggestions because I'm uh, a bit tired. And the suggestion, uh, the first suggestion in that case is the, is the good one. Uh, so this is because k is closed and, uh, and x is, uh, oops, I should have put that here if I want to follow my outline. Uh, so the computer agrees that uh, k is compact. And now the extreme value theorem is meant to do the hard work and give me p. Uh, so uh, let's do that. I will claim. Uh, I will obtain uh, p and uh, prove that uh, p is in, um, is in k. So I, I cheated a bit by copy-pasting that line, which is a bit long to, to type. But this is the, the claim uh, that I want to prove. And so I'm asking for suggestions about how to prove this. And this computer is not very fast. This is a, a laptop. So and there are lots of suggestions, but uh, one of them is nice. Uh, this one uses compactness of k, my k compact assumption. So, and, uh, so Patrick, Patrick, yeah. If you if you picked one of the not nice suggestions, what would happen? Yeah, but well, you get uh, you get into a, a dead end. I mean, for instance, in the extreme case that I showed, uh, if I if I pick the suggestion to prove that k is finite, here, uh, then the computer will happily tell me, okay, now your goal is to prove that k is finite. But then I'm obviously stuck because there is no reason why you uh, why you <laughs> right, But I, I'm just wondering. So so now if you try so if you ask for suggestions for proving k is finite, which it can't have. Yeah. Then then probably it will have it won't have any any nice suggestion. And uh, I mean I, I can try, but uh, <laughs> uh, I mean hopefully it cannot prove that. I mean, it has subjection, suggestions that would be like uh, apply the definition of being finite or prove that it is not infinite or prove that it has at most one element. <laughs> uh, I guess the reason I'm, I guess the reason I'm asking, I guess the reason I'm asking is sometimes, you know, uh, certainly for me, when I try to do a proof, there are dead ends, right? I have wrong yeah. ideas, I have not so good, some intuition doesn't quite work. And that's part of the process. So I'm just yeah. wondering how one manipulates. Here you know the answer. So that's, uh, uh, 
part of what was discussed at the end of the, the previous talk is that uh, we also need more, uh, we need better counterexample generators and, and better, uh, yeah, better tools to see this is a dead end. So either counterexample generators, but in this case, you see, uh, it's difficult because you need to find a counterexample, which is a metric space, uh, a compact metric space. And uh, okay, maybe in that case, uh, how do you try several nice compact metric spaces? Maybe you say, okay, I will cheat, I will use finite set. Those are com compact metric spaces. But in that case, it will be true that K is, uh, is finite. Uh, so you're out of luck. So you really need uh, to have a way to uh, generate, for, for in this example, an interesting uh, sample of, uh, of metric spaces uh, 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 that are not uh, finite and where you can algorithmically test whether or not this statement about K being finite is true. So it is a non-trivial problem, but this is uh, I mean this whole area is full of uh, interesting research topics, and uh, but this is uh, there are many things that work well in counterexample generations, but for uh, the purpose of program verifications. I mean, if you are uh, stating a lemma about lists or uh, arrays in, uh, in in computer science, in programming, uh, then, then there are very good ways to uh, build counterexample to optimistic statements about uh, finite lists and stuff like that. But for metric spaces, it's not so clear. Now, let's go back to my proof, and uh, now, what is the answer from the computer? Uh, so now I've got three goals. Oh, I need to prove that K is non-empty. This is what the computer answers. So where was that on my PDF file? You never discussed that case, no? This is no extreme point, yeah? You miss it. <laughs> Yeah, because I mean the extreme value theorem is clearly wrong for an empty uh, yeah. compact set. I mean it's meant to to give p in k. So if if k is empty, this is clearly hopeless. So so yeah, I missed a step. So why k non-empty? Uh, for instance, if if the function is con is constant, then definitely k is empty. So. <laughs> So that's, that's actually a big problem in this proof. I mean, if, if k can be empty, so I've got a proof of this Einer-Cantor theorem saying that uniform continuous function on compact metric space as uniformly continuous, but that proof doesn't work for constant function. That's a bit embarrassing. <laughs> but, but okay, let's let's do a, a case split. So maybe I will uh, I will rather. Um, uh, discuss independently what happens if uh, when k is empty and uh, so I, I added this command. Uh, no, where is it? It's not very convenient. Uh, I, I I'll tell the computer uh, discuss by cases depending uh, on uh, this statement. K is either equal to the empty set or non-empty, and then I pass pasted the proof of what you need to write in case k is empty, but it's actually not completely obvious, I mean, it's completely obvious, but you still need to write uh, four lines explaining... Yeah, but if it's empty, it's already yeah. a uniform kind yeah. of system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, so, so that's very fine. Uh, so it's very simple, but you still need to write something. And, uh, and, and this is a case where we would like the artificial intelligence people to tell us, okay, I will handle that case. And, and, uh, and then you go on with your proof of the interesting part of, uh, of the proof. <laughs> so, uh, so now uh, I can... Uh, I can uh, continue my proof uh, because uh, k is um, is uh, is not empty. So what is it? And uh, and then I, ne I need again a continuity proof. So uh, let ask the computer to handle this continuity proof. And uh, now I'm back on track. Uh, I've got my assumption. Uh, I've got my point p, uh, and the assumption that it minimizes the distance uh, on uh, on k. And uh, now I can do. Uh, uh, I can like, finish the proof uh, using uh, distance between P1 and P2 as my uh, delta. What? P2. Ah, P2, okay. Hey, the computer is really picky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but the computer says I have two things to prove. Hey, I need to prove that this distance between P1 and P2 is positive because I announced a positive delta. Ah, where was it in my PDF? <laughs> uh, you know, there is a test you can do, I and mean, what I'm teaching to my students is, I mean, at the very beginning of the proof, I fixed a positive epsilon. And question, where did I use that epsilon is positive? Nowhere. 
I didn't use that at all. At no point in, in this sketch I used that epsilon was positive. So probably now is the time to use that epsilon was positive. Okay, uh, okay I need to uh, do that and uh, use that uh, epsilon is, is positive and, uh, and again adding five lines of, uh, of proof that I did by cheating, by copy-pasting uh, the proof, then I, I proved that delta is positive. And now I can go on and I hope there won't be too many uh, more surprises. So let's fix x and x prime and x and uh, contrapose to get this new goal and, and finish everything. So I just contraposing and after contraposition, this is exactly my assumption x applied to x and x prime, as, ex, assumption h applied to x and x prime, and the computer <laughs> says this is uh, one. So Gagné is, is one in, uh, you win in, in English. Okay, so <laughs> we explained that proof uh, and filling the in the gaps in the, in, in the meantime, and that was not too painful. So of course, the, this is still a, a propaganda talk. I mean, sometimes when you explain mathematics to a computer, it is actually more painful, and, and you have actual surprises and not surprises that you put by hand. I mean, this is a proof that I found on Wikipedia, and at first I thought it was a nice proof, and then when I realized that you had to fill those two gaps, I thought it was not so nice in the end. Uh, but okay, let's move on. Uh, so what is it good for? So you have already seen the main point. This uh, we are having fun doing that. <laughs> Uh, which is, of course, uh, what we always do. I mean, as researchers, I mean, then we have to rationalize and explain to people why it's important that you find mathematics and theoretical physics, but, but we are just having fun. Uh, and, and, but then, there are, when we rationalize, we have a couple of uh, different motivations, and I, I will discuss uh, in more or less details four motivations about checking mathematics, explaining mathematics, teaching how to do mathematics, and, and creating new mathematics. So uh, the first, the obvious one is checking. So you've already seen, I, I, I caught two little mistakes in, in my proof. And of course, there is this referee dream uh, in mathematics uh, where you're the referee of a submitted paper. And what you do is you read, you read the introduction and uh, you decide that this is interesting and uh, that there are new ideas that are nicely explained in the introduction. And then uh, you still have 100 pages uh, long of technical details to check, but this is not a problem because the computer is, uh, is checking everything. Okay, so that would be nice. So this is uh, uh, complete science fiction in case it wasn't clear. Uh, there is no short-term hope. So what we could do on a, on a shorter term uh, is focus on, on more specific targets. So we could focus on proofs that are too big uh, to... to and to keep in mind, and uh, for instance, the classification of uh, finite simple groups, I maybe mean, this is too big, so nobody is really sure we covered everything, so we, we could try to do that. I mean, that, that would take a very long time, but, but this kind of, we could still decide that if this theorem we really want to know, we could put a big team of, of mathematicians on formalizing the, this proof and maybe be done in. A, I know in less than 10 years, and, and people would know that the classification of finite simple groups actually works. Uh, this is not really what we are doing so far. Uh, what we are doing is focusing on, on very technical fragments of proof. Uh, maybe we can just s focus on one specific step, uh, which is not too big, but super technical, and, and we want to be sure this is correct. So for about giant proofs, I, I've put a couple of examples. So you see, there is Lurie style kind of mathematics. So I think this is the first book by Lurie. Uh, so it's already uh, 700 pages long, but then you need to stack uh, at least two more uh, before you get to the applications. And, uh, and this is a bit difficult to digest. Uh, uh, in symplectic topology, we have these foundational issues and people like Hofer, Vysotsky and Sanders, they write, also write books of, the, of that size. And again, this is a book about foundations of how we could solve technical difficulties in, in symplectic uh, <laughs> geometry, but there is no application at all in this uh, 700 pages long book. And that example, it doesn't look too long because it says 161 pages, but this is part one. And, and uh, this is, uh, I think, currently holding the record in, in this field of uh, how long a series of paper has been submitted. So you can see where is the date, 2012. So this summer would be the 10th uh, anniversary of submission of this series of papers 
uh, to a very well-known journal uh, around here. Uh, and this is simply stuck in the process of, uh, of referring and, and verification. And there is no controversy. I mean, nobody is saying uh, they are cheating and uh, nothing works. It's just a, this is too big, too technical, and it doesn't converge. Um. And now about technical fragments, we have a very nice example uh, to share, thanks to Peter Scholz, uh, who is also well known here in IHES. So Peter Scholz proved in uh, 2019 a theorem that he thinks is very important. So the, the general context is uh, Scholz's effort to unite uh, different kinds of geometry and arithmetic into something that he calls condensed mathematics, and I don't have any time to discuss condensed mathematics, but he thinks uh, this is uh, a very important uh, theorem that he proved. And so there is one theorem he, he was not entirely sure about, and, and this theorem is crucial. I mean, it says, the hope that condensed formalism can be fruitfully applied to real function analysis tends or fall. I think this is of utmost foundational importance. And he thinks that nobody will ever check this. Uh, this theorem, uh, because uh, so he thought very carefully about it, and uh, and he said he he got obsessed about it and was getting crazy. Uh, at the end, he, he was happy with his proof. So his proof was is also joint work with Dustin Clausen, uh, and he was then he was very happy to learn that uh, many people were reading his paper uh, around the world because each any time Scholz writes anything, they are uh, working reading groups. Uh, all over the world uh, trying to understand the details. But then uh, to each of those people who organized such a reading group, he asked, did you check or did you read, or did you discuss the proof of this theorem? And they all said, no, we, we got tired before reaching this theorem and it, it looked too complicated. And, uh, and so, uh, he, he, so he, he wrote uh, messages to people doing formalized mathematics and then he wrote a blog post to announce that he he challenged the people doing formalized mathematics to check that specific uh, theorem. Not everything he has done so far, but that, uh, I think it was about 25 pages, uh, so very, very short proof compared to what I've shown before, uh, but with lots of moving pieces and, uh, and uh, very unclear why the strategy was successful and so on. And then, uh, half a year later, he wrote that he was very excited to announce the experiment has verified the entire part of the argument he wasn't sure about. And, and he found this uh, very interesting, and, and he, he was really surprised. So he, he writes, I find it absolutely insane that your interactive proof assistants are not at the level that within a very reasonable time span they can formally verify difficult original research. So he congratulated us, and uh, the main guy leading this effort was Johan Komlin from Freiburg, but then he he, he got help from uh, many people uh, proving little pieces uh, along the way. So that was uh, really a big success, and, uh, and this is uh, non-trivial, very modern mathematics. The prerequisites were not too huge. I mean, if the challenge had been, uh, could you please check my paper with Laurent Farg on the geometrization of the long lens program, then we would have been completely out of luck. But, but with this thing, uh, it, was, uh, it was doable uh, because they, the, what he wanted to check was a very technical, but rather elementary, I mean, not elementary in the sense, not as elementary as what I've been discussing earlier, I mean, uh, elementary compared to uh, what he does uh, usually. Okay, so that's something we can do. But for me, this is not the main motivation, because uh, what I really care about is not so much being 100% sure that a very technical proof is, is correct. Uh, what I really like is understanding mathematics and explaining mathematics to other people. And I think this is a stronger motivation. The issue with our current way of explaining mathematics is that when you write a mathematics paper or, or even a textbook, you need to decide what your readers already know and what is the level of detail that you will provide. And the author has to decide something, because you, you cannot do like Russell and, and, and Whitehead and write all the details all the time and get something that nobody can read. I mean, you, you can do that with foundational papers, but, but not with uh, Schultz stuff or, or with the, the examples that I've shown before. So we need some way uh, to get a document where the, the reader can choose the level of detail. So again, I, I don't want to lose the uh, hand waving and the little pictures and the drawings on the, on the blackboard. So I want to have all this uh, informal sketch and an informal description. But then 
the reader need to be able to uh, click on, for instance, a fuzzy statement and say, I want to have a more precise uh, version of, of this statement. And, uh, and then maybe I want a proof sketch of that one. And in that step of the proof sketch, I want more details on this. And so that hopefully, I mean, the, the best situation would be uh, if it never stops. I mean, you can go from all the way from the completely complete hand waving uh, to the axiom of mathematics smoothly uh, without too much uh, friction in the transition and, and maybe at some point you ask for more details and you regret and you just uh, back up and, uh, and ask for less details and so on. So this is currently uh, science fiction. I mean we don't have uh, these, those nice documents but that should be, that should be doable uh, without a revolution in artificial intelligence along the way. So if you, if you remember only one answer to this question, why explain mathematics to a computer, my answer, for me the main motivation is we want human readers to choose the detail level. And, uh, and checking correctness is, uh, is a nice side effect of, of this, but, uh, but maybe sometimes we, we won't have full correctness, there will be statements that are admitted, and, uh, uh, but at least you can, yeah, you can try to you can get access to as, as many uh, detail level as possible. Uh, okay, so we, we are not only explaining uh, mathematics, we are also explaining how to do mathematics, especially to students. So I'm a, I'm a teacher, I'm teaching in Orsay, and uh, I have students uh, who not only have to learn mathematics, they also uh, need to learn how to prove stuff. What is a proof? Uh, how does that work? And, uh, and this is a bit different from explaining uh, mathematics itself. It's a more uh, meta-theoretical uh, thing. So I've been using a proof assistant. So I've been using this proof assistant, Lynn, that I'm showing uh, earlier, uh, with, uh, with students, and it's, it works pretty well. I mean, I'm not using exactly the interface that we've seen, uh, because so the students had no difficulty. So I, at first, I, I used exactly what I've shown you. And the students didn't have too much trouble uh, typing commands like I was doing, but then they had a lot of trouble uh, going from those uh, commands to uh, normal proofs on paper, to uh, informal proofs. So they, they think that going from formal to informal is, is difficult. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then uh, so I, I wrote a layer where you can write something in control natural language and still get the computer understanding. Uh, and that works much better, because uh, it's, it's slightly harder to write. So it's, it's harder to write in controlled natural language than in uh, normal programming language. Uh, but then, when you want to go to paper, it's, uh, it's easier. So because this is not a teaching place, I won't insist too much on, uh, on this. And then, I mean, the last big one is, uh, can this kind of tool help us create mathematics? Do um, research in, in mathematics. And there are a couple of ways where they could be useful. So they are purely technologi technological ways. It's easy to tweak definitions and statements and assumptions. Uh, you can just, if you change the definition in one of those systems, the system will uh, answer uh, telling you what is broken, uh, what are the, state, the theorem that no longer works or, or need modifications to the proof and, and what is still fine. And uh, this is helpful. Uh, the system can tell you if you have uh, completely unneeded assumptions. Uh, so this happened to me when I, so with uh, Kevin Buzzard and Johan Comlin, we explained uh, Scholz's uh, perfectoid spaces to a computer. And in, uh, in the middle of this explanation, we need stuff about general topology that is explained in, in Bourbaki uh, general topology book. And in one of the theorems, there is a completely unneeded assumption in Bourbaki. This is pretty surprising. I don't know what they were doing if it's a, uh, copy-paste typo, but it was written in the 40s, so I don't know what copy-paste meant in, uh, in the 40s. But so at the end of the proof, I thought, I don't think I've used completeness of that space that they assume. And I just went back to the statement, removed the completeness assumption, and the computer was still happy. So I just say, uh, OK, I'm happy. And we also have uh, automated tools to remove unnecessary assumptions and, and stuff like that. So this is rather uh, easy stuff. Uh, for com from a computer science point of view. Uh, much harder is, I hope that this will be uh, nice to search for mathematics. 
Because currently, if you, if you want to ask uh, Google or any other search engine uh, about a CRM statement, the, the results are very poor. But hopefully, with, with the, some help from neural networks or stuff like that, uh, you, you should be able to type a, a mathematical statement and, uh, and the computer would find not only the exact match, but also lemmas that look like what you've been uh, asking for. And that would be very useful. I mean, fuzzy matching for uh, uh, searching uh, lemmas and definitions. So we are not yet there, but uh, this should be easier. And of course, have we seen this morning that artificial intelligence people are very optimistic that they will simply prove everything for us, uh, and that may happen. Uh, of course, I have no, nothing smart to say about that, except that they, the people who, who played Go uh, five years ago, they felt very safe and they thought that they were safe for 1,000 years before a computer would beat them at playing Go. And so most mathematicians think they are safe and artificial intelligence won't beat them at doing mathematics in the, in the next 1,000 years, but uh, that may be a bit unwise. Uh, but, uh, so I'm not betting on anything. Uh, I mean, certainly, currently, uh, we, we, are not, uh, we are not out of a job yet. Uh, we'll see. Uh, my hope is that artificial intelligence uh, will be at the level of a smart colleague. Like, I, I'm, I'm talking to the computer, and instead of suggesting stupid things like proving that K is finite, uh, it will give me the relevant suggestion first, uh, and then help me doing my proof along the way. And there is... Uh, something more abstract, but which is very important, is that formalizing mathematics really encourages clean abstraction. So, of course, it encourages uh, having uh, clear ideas of what you're doing, but also I mean, finding the right definitions uh, uh, that nicely cover many situations. Uh, it's much more important when you're talking to a computer. Uh, because, you, because you have to prove everything, so you don't want to reprove everything 100 times. Uh, and for this, I will uh, give one very short example. I think yeah, we started uh, 10 minutes late, right? Uh, so I can, uh, uh, I can show you. Maybe you, you could have asked what happens in this proof if I ask for a suggestion at the very beginning. We didn't do that. So let's remove all the proof and ask for suggestion here. And certainly, it finds a good suggestion, which is to apply ein Cantor CRM uh, to prove this. So the, the computer say, suggests this is exactly the lemma that is called compact space dot uniform continuous of continuous applied to this assumption HF, which is my continuity assumption. So of course, this is a trick that also works on paper. I mean, the, the easiest way to prove something is to say someone already did the job. <laughs> but this is not what I wanted to show. What I wanted to show is the proof of this uh, Ein Cantor theorem that the computer already knows about. So I'm just hitting a button say, telling him, show me the proof. And this is the proof that it's showing. This is a one, two, three, five, six lines computation. So what is this proof? It doesn't look like the proof I was explaining. I mean, it's much shorter and it's a, it's a computation. Uh, so it's not so easy to read, so uh, I will show you a LaTeX version of this. So this is the LaTeX version of the proof we were looking at. And uh, maybe the first thing uh, you could have noticed from the, from the statement is that it doesn't start, if I go to the proof, uh, the, the assumption is not that uh, alpha and beta are metric space, they are uniform spaces, whatever it means. So first this is a more general version. So it, it covers metric spaces, but also topological groups and rings, for instance. And then the proof is this computation. So what is, this, what is all this? So, so clearly, it's using some more abstract stuff. Uh, of course, it's also hiding the, the difficulty in one of the steps. So actually, everything happens on the first line. Uh, everything happens on the, on the first line, and then it's a completely easy uh, computation. So what this is using is the technology of filters uh, that was invented by uh, Bourbaki uh, again in the early 40s. Uh, and that no, almost no mathematician used filters on a day-to-day -day basis, but in proof assistance, they are everywhere. And they are everywhere, uh, and so this example is a bit complicated to explain, so I will explain a, a simpler example motivating this. So let's talk about limits 
that you teach to first year undergrad. So you have limits of sequences. So if sequence un goes to x when n goes to infinity. And we have limits of function at a point, or limit of a function at a point from the right, or limit at a, of a function at a point, but you remove the point where you're taking the limit, so the pointed limit. And uh, maybe there are limits that are not points, but plus infinity. Uh, and maybe there are limits where x goes to plus infinity and f of x goes to plus infinity. There are many variations. Even using simply sequences and functions from real number to real number, there are already many uh, variations. So let's forget about sequence. Focus on, on a function from r to r. The source and target could be plus or minus infinity, a point, a point from the left, from the right, plus variation where the point is, is not allowed, and maybe variation also when uh, the x is constrained to some subspace, say rational numbers. So we are actually uh, talking about, so let's say I've listed uh, 16 variations. So there is not one definition of a limit on, uh, in this setup. There are uh, 256 definitions. Okay, that's, that's a, uh, a lot, but let's say that's fine. But then we want to prove lemmas about this. And, and an important lemma is that limits compose. So if you have, uh, for instance, if f of x goes to y0 when x goes to x0, and g of x goes to z0, g of y should, have a y should go to z0 when y goes to y0, then the composition goes to z0. And maybe we want to have more details that it goes to z0 from the right, if we had a, a limit here saying that g goes to z0, approaching it from the right. So how many lemmas are we talking about here? Well, we are talking about 16 times 16 times 16, that's 4,000 lemmas. And when we teach that to our first year undergrad, this is fine. I mean, we do one case, two case, and then we say the, the rest is exercises for the reader. And, uh, <laughs> and, and you see, uh, it always works the same, this proof of composition of limit. So we certainly, we don't want to write uh, 4,000 proofs. But uh, Bourbaki had this issue that they wanted to actually prove everything and not, not saying and the proof is always the same. Uh, and we have this same issue with formalized mathematics. So they invented some gadget that they called filters. And uh, very briefly, I will explain what it is. Uh, so each time you've got a set, of course, you've got the power set, so subset of x. But this set of subset of x can be embedded into something bigger that are kind of generalized subset of x. And those generalized subsets are called filters. And for instance, uh, the filter neighborhood of plus infinity, it's a filter on R, it is a generalized set, and you should think of it as a generalized set of very large numbers. And uh, maybe neighborhood of x0 is the generalized set of points that are close to x0. This is the intuitive uh, meaning of those uh, filters. So there are two examples of filters. And then, so there is a definition. Uh, I mean, this is nothing fuzzy. So I, I've tried to write this definition small enough that you can't read it. Uh, but there is an actual definition, and it's not a long definition. Uh, and those filters, they are implemented as a, a set of subsets of x. But, but don't, we don't really care about, about this implementation. There, there is a formal definition. And, uh, and for instance, the neighborhood of x0 is indeed the set of neighborhoods of x0. So a set containing an open set containing x0. Uh, and now the thing is that you can put an order relation on those generalized subsets, an order relation that generalizes uh, inclusion of subset of x. So this maps uh, putting the uh, subset of x into generalized subset of x is order preserving. So this generalizes inclusion. And you can also generalize uh, direct image or, or inverse image under a map. If you've got a map from x to y, say you've got the direct image sending subset of x to subset of y. Uh, and this is extended to a direct image uh, from uh, filters on x, so generalized subset of x to generalized subset of x, and, and the same with, uh, with pullback, and, uh, and do satisfy the, what you expect from uh, direct image and inverse image. Uh, one of them is uh, covariant and the other one is contravariant. And now, what is the definition of limit? So we, we wanted to write 256 uh, definitions, and, and they are there. Uh, 
So if you give me any generalized subset of x and any generalized subset of y, say that f converges to this g along f if the generalized direct image of f is uh, contained, is, uh, is you should read subset of this generalized subset of g. So for instance, in the case of, uh, of convergence uh, with respect to neighborhood of x uh, along a neighborhood of y, you just say that the, you read this as, if you look at the direct image of the set of points that are very close to x, then you, <coughs> you, you land inside the generalized set of points that are very close to y. And so this covers all the, the definitions that we needed. And now let's prove 4,000 lemmas, but because I'm a bit short on time, uh, this is the proof of 4,000 lemmas uh, that limits compose. Okay, and this is, uh, I mean, I could spend a couple more minutes uh, explaining this, but the, the, the main point is this is a three-line computation uh, using, uh, I mean, the key point is this uh, covariance property here. So you've, you've got to prove something at, at some point, but, but then you have proven uh, 4,000 uh, lemmas. And uh, this basically has been known since Bourbaki, but, uh, but nobody uses it on paper, except in very specialized situations. You may, you may have heard of ultra filters, for instance. But, but using it for a, as a general purpose device to talk about limits and other stuff like this is done only in formalized mathematics. And uh, so what we've gained is that uh, we, we've all those uh, lemmas and, uh, and definitions are now unified. And this was not about computer science and uh, about uh, having a software doing something magic. This uh, completely uh, normal mathematics uh, that is not used by normal mathematicians and that is used everywhere, uh, not only in the proof assistant that I'm using, but also in, in Isabel and in Koch. They, they have filters everywhere. And once you've uh, started to think about this, there is really no going back. I know I, know I have trouble thinking about limits in, uh, in a different way. So that's, that's a nice story. Even if, if it was not invented specifically for formalized mathematics, but, but in spirit, it's, a, it's very much a benefit of formalized mathematics. And now, uh, very quickly, so I've already said that there are lots of proof assistants uh, based in various countries, but also having... A, having international communities.
quick tensor experiment, which was Uh, a file uh, about the um, uh, Gromov-Hausdorff distances between uh, between metric spaces and the Gromov-Hausdorff space. And if you want to to go to the formalization, you you can click this source link and uh, and you get code like I was showing you. And it currently, it's hard to read because we don't have this uh, Dream the document where you can uh, uh, smoothly. in this system and, and what is not yet formalized uh, and there is a lot to do <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I answered the question uh, yeah. oh, very good. <coughs> other questions I have a completely superficial questions should the next layer one should put kind of two-dimensional light notations like indices and so on because it's really very unpleasant to... Ah, yeah. So, I indeed, it, it would be better if we had a nicer rendering in, in this, uh, this uh, right-hand side of the screen. Uh, and that, that will come and uh, 
Th this is not a this is not a big challenge. I mean, you need engineering power to, to do that. I mean, there are more interesting challenges uh, on the input side. For instance, in uh, in certain areas of mathematics, you've got so-called commutative diagrams all over the place, and there are uh, little two-dimensional drawings with uh, uh, spaces uh, and, and arrows between them. And uh, it's it's much more efficient to. I don't have chalk. Um, it's much more efficient to to look at a diagram which looks like this, uh, and I don't know, maybe there is, there is uh, something like this. And uh, if you if you write this uh, as a sequence uh, instead, uh, saying you've got f goes from x to y, and uh, pi goes from x to z and uh, f bar goes from uh, z to uh, y and there is an assumption saying that f bar composed pi is, uh, is f. This is much harder to read and, and that was a diagram with only three pieces and if you have 10 or, or 20 of them uh, then the, the least version becomes uh, ugly but uh, there are people thinking about this. I mean uh, both reading uh, diagrams and uh, and displaying the, them and uh, and doing the uh, kind of boring diagram chasing proofs, uh, automating those things. Uh, there, are, there are people thinking about all this, uh, and it, this will get better. Uh, and this was, you see, this was not a priority for people doing software verifications. I mean, those, those proof assistants have existed for a very long time, but but clearly, if your main focus is uh, for instance, writing a certified uh, C compiler, uh, which is one, one of the big highlights of, uh, of software verification, that then you don't really need to think about handling commutative diagrams. But since in recent years there have been more and more mathematicians uh, using this, we are pushing uh, towards uh, supporting that kind of things uh, instead of uh, stuff that are more relevant to software verification. So this will come. What about transferring this to the legal system? So can one check the you know, laws? And, and I the think there are people uh, trying to apply formal methods to laws and... Uh, and uh, so tropical mathematics will apply to Tropical mathematics? Yes, yes, yeah. successfully. Yeah. 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 I think so, yeah. That's, that exists. Yeah. Mm. Huge libraries of, of precedents and uh, yeah. all these things that... Uh, Lawyers charging enormous amounts of money. For yeah. <laughs> no, 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 there are clearly people who work on this. Yeah. I mean, both on the formal side and on the informal side of just uh, telling things without any formal specifications. Uh. Okay. Thanks. 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 Okay. Could you, uh, I know this is a research conference, but I would be interested in, in hearing about the pedagogical consequences of introducing those methods for undergrads and even first year undergrad. Because wh what you said was that they had a hard time to go from very formal to normal way of writing the mathematics. Yeah. To me that suggests that they didn't understand anything about what they were doing. Yeah, yeah, in the, in but, but I don't know, I would like you to tell us if you, you saw some you know, good impact of introducing yeah. those things. And so. Uh, what I said, what was difficult was going from typing those commands that, you, that you've seen, intro, or, or uh, I don't know, have stuff, and, uh, uh, and to, to normal writing. And, and indeed, when they could prove stuff using those commands and, and could not write a proof on paper, it clearly means that they didn't get uh, what's, uh, what was happening. And, uh, and indeed, so the main point for me uh, of using a proof assistant with students is not that the proof assistants uh, cannot be treated. The main point is that the proof assistant is very patiently uh, displaying where we are in the proof, what is the current goal, and what are the assumptions. And this is what is really helping students. And this you cannot do on the blackboard or, or in a textbook, just writing at every step of the proof uh, where we are and, and what are the assumptions and what is the current goal. Um, but indeed, this is so helpful that for certain uh, simple proof, uh, you can just follow your nose uh, much uh, in a much more easy, much easier way. To, it's much easier to follow your nose when you have this uh, assistance. And, uh, and if you do that too much, you just react to the syntax of the, of the goal and the syntax of the assumptions. And, and you can, it's a bit surprising uh, how much you can prove in very elementary mathematics. I mean, uh, in properties about uh, uh, 
uh, functions and uh, sequences and stuff like that uh, without really understanding what you're doing. So uh, what I wanted to, uh, to tell the students about that is that they need to uh, have two modes of operating. Sometimes they are just following their nose and, and sometimes they need to realize that uh, an idea is required. Uh, and this is actually very useful that to have the proof assistant for this because you can very clearly distinguish the moments where you are just following your nose and the moments where you need an idea. And when you need an idea and you take a wrong turn, so for instance, you, the, the current goal is proof there exists a positive delta such as this and this. And if you choose the wrong delta, or maybe you're just optimistic and say maybe delta equal one will work, uh, then, they, then a couple of lines later, they are completely stuck. And you can come and tell, ask them, what was the risky move? And it goes through the proof with them and say, this was not risky. This was just introducing epsilon. Uh, you need to do it anyway. And, and ah, maybe when you say, uh, let's use delta equal one, that was risky. And, uh, and, and they get something out of this. And, uh, and then uh, at least the rather good students, uh, they, they really improve in their mathematical writing. I mean, I could show you uh, stuff written by first year undergrads uh, that, that are really nice to read. So we are cheating a bit because we are taking good first year undergrads. Not, uh, not, I mean, they, uh, we have these uh, students who choose to do a double major in mathematics and something else, and those are selected. And, uh, they, and yeah, they are, they are rather good students, uh, but, uh, and, but yeah, we, we have successes. I mean, they, they really write more structured proofs and, and they understand what's going on. Uh, Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's, that's inspiring. Yeah. Okay. Let's think. Thank you.